Welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello, and this is part two of the interview I'm doing with Simon Roche of Sightlanders. Did I say that pretty well, Simon? Not too bad. Sightlanders. 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 Yeah. You've got to start pretty hard on that, that essay. Sightlanders. <laughs> uh, Sightlanders means southerners. Um, it's uh, the people who uh, settled the very southern tip of South Africa um, long before black people arrived. And uh, the original inhabitants were actually the small light brown bushmen of that area. And uh, the, the black people actually migrated um, south from the, the northern uh, nations in the continent of Africa. If you haven't watched part one of this interview, I encourage you to jump over there and, uh, and watch it now. Um, we'll, we'll put the link certainly beneath this video in the description and uh, maybe get it up there as well. Um, and it is on my website, davepello.com. Uh, Simon, for those who haven't watched it yet and just want to watch this one straight away, explain to us a little bit about your background uh, in the ANC, some of the, the high-level um, diplomatic and bureaucratic things you were doing, just to establish the kind of connections and access to information that you do have. Dave, uh, I have to be circumspect, but what I can tell you is that um, I was an ANC activist at university um, because I believe that the solution to South Africa's problem at that time, I'm 47 years old. I was born in 1971, and our first uh, multiracial democratic elections occurred in 1994, when I would have been 23 years old. Mm -hmm. And in the preceding years, when we were going through quite a tremendous crisis in South Africa, I was one of those people who believed that it couldn't carry on that way. It, would, it was detrimental to all concerned um, and that the best solution was to work hand in hand to build a peaceful and prosperous society. Yep. Um, subsequent to that, I, I was not an employee of the ANC. I often uh, use the phrase, I worked for the ANC, meaning I did work for the like ANC. a consultant or a contractor. <clears throat> That's exactly correct. That's precisely correct. Um, and you, you, I, I, were, you, you had access to the people and influences. Uh, you weren't somebody on the outside watching. You had connection and, and connections and networks in the... In yeah, the, well, uh, to illustrate where I fitted into the picture, I executed as the project manager two presidential inaugurations. I was also the uh, director of the, a very, very famous ANC conference, the one that elected Jacob Zuma, a massive conference, mm -hmm. um, so big that we had to import a venue from overseas. Uh, 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 yeah. Um, and so one thing led to the next, to the point where I was doing certain work through other people for the presidency, for example. Right. And I don't talk about it because it's not the, the right thing to do on the one hand. Yeah, it's not. Um, we don't want you to brag and, and you don't want to brag. I get that. But what I want to do is just paint the connection for people that you're not some crackpot tinfoil wearing conspiracy theorist with, with an internet connection. You actually yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah, I was there up close and personal. I mean, I wrote certain very sensitive documents with these 10 fingers. You know, uh, that's about as candid as I would like to be. But I think it... it Kind of sure. endorses what you've just said. Yeah, right. And and now bring us into the current. Your current role is with Sightlanders, uh, the yes. the civil defence preparation organisation. Can you want you want to give us just a thirty second overview on on what that organisation does mm -hmm. and and just your role there now? Yes, Sightlanders is an organisation that believes that the trajectory of South Africa is such that it's going to lead to a crisis, <clears throat> and we are preparing. Uh, for a civil war. We are an organization constituted under the aegis yeah. of protocols one and two additional to the Geneva Conventions, which govern the circumstances of civilians in conditions of civil war or international war. Mm -hmm. So within those protocols, there are certain laws. Within those laws, we are constituted. We are entitled to be who we are preparing mm. for a civil war. Right. Great. Look, um, uh, I have to take a moment just to, to dwell on the weight of those words, which, which must break your heart. I mean, you, you can say them fast because you do so many interviews. Um, 
but you know, for the viewer, what would it be like if you were preparing for civil war in your home nation? For us in Australia, if we were preparing for civil war, what kind of tragic series of events would have to lead to that place where we seriously think civil war is probable, if not inevitable, and that we have to defend our lives, our families and our properties against attack from our government or our neighbours? Uh, that's a significant heartbreaking thing to see in your nation. Yes, it is heartbreaking, particularly for those of us who have kids. Um, there are some idiots who kind of love schadenfreude, you know, this uh, concept of joy in destruction. Um, but by and large, Saitlanders are not that. We tend to be very middle class and family oriented. We're not the typical profile of the rabid right winger. And I, Certainly don't see myself as a rabid right winger. Um, There's no such thing right? as a right winger. There's only Marxists, Greens, <laughs> leftists, and then far right. There's nothing in between a leftist and a far right extremist, if you believe the mainstream media. Uh, okay. <laughs> is it, I think that what this is about, to answer your question directly, is a tension between competing groups or groups who believe that they are competing with one another. Mm. It's very much like the, the Yugoslav breakup, uh, you know, the Yugoslavian civil wars that followed the Yugoslav breakup where different groups with different identities, different norms and values and mores as mm. its legal terms go, uh, can't reconcile Mm. themselves to one another or can't reconcile those competing uh, values, norms, and mores. Yep. We're in a situation now where the conservative whites of South Africa cannot see how things are going to get better in South Africa because they always get worse. Year by year, it gets a little bit worse. Well, I have I to ask a, a question. Forgive me for interrupting you. I, I sort of want to be a no. bit scatterbrained and just follow the, 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 um, the interview in this question. Let me actually preface my, my rabbit trail question with a, a disclaimer for the viewer. Um, I can't ask Simon about um, speculative opinion. You know, what does he think will happen? What could, you know, we can't actually ask about the strategies and the politics of, of what might happen and is in the future for, for his own safety and for the safety and success of, of um, the organization. We're going to stick this interview to the facts, historical and, and recent, um, and just uh, uh, um, effect and serve as a kind of information service um, that at the very least requires us to go and, and verify or, or disprove. Um, but you mentioned a term there just now, Simon, white conservatives. Um, mm. Are there black conservatives in South Africa? What do they think about the emerging situation, the, the imminent crisis, if they exist? Uh, I, I think that they're, they're few in number, but I can tell you that I think I described to you previously that we have four major population groups in South Africa. The blacks who comprise, I think, 79%, just about 80%. And then the, um, the, the whites who comprise about 8.5%. Mm -hmm. The coloreds who comprise, that is to say, mixed race people who insist upon being called colored and not black. Mm -hmm. um, they are about uh, 9 or 10% of our population. And then the, about 2.5% of our population is of Indian origin, people who came to South Africa uh, in the 1860s, I believe, to work in sugarcane fields. What about the um, Bushmen? Do they fit in the coloured category? No, they they are obliged to be black. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're not happy about it. Uh, and many of them, in fact, identify as coloureds. It's quite an interesting phenomenon. Mm. Um, I know v intimately well one man who is a pure-blood Bushman um, who masquerades as a, as a colored. Um, he, he just, uh, yeah, he says as a Bushman, he, he gets too vilified by black people. If black people see him identifying as a Bushman, hmm. they mock him. Um, and so on. There've been television programs about this. The, hmm. Bush, the Bushmen to this day are treated quite badly. They're despised. 
in yeah. many black circles. And they're the actual Aboriginal, absolutely original inhabitants and owners, as far as anybody knows in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, yes. Beyond dispute, beyond any debate. So that, that's in really terms of those... Bear in mind. It's really important yeah, to bear yeah. in mind. That's in a, terms of those four primary population groups, to answer your, your question in a unfortunately a roundabout way, sure. I have been contacted by a number of Indian people, I'd say about eight, um, a handful of coloreds, four or five, um, and one black man to ask if they could either join our organization or if their own organizations could ally with us. So that's the best answer I can give to your question. There are people other than whites in mm. South Africa who yeah. are firmly convinced that there's going to be a crisis in this country, that things can't go on the way they are, and they would like to make a plan for it. I can tell you that in the, in the Muslim community, <clears throat> which is dominated by people of Indian ethnicity, but there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. So these Muslim Indians, uh, I'm oversimplifying, um, are preparing at a, an astonishing rate. Mm -hmm. I've held conversations with people from the Islamic community, the Muslim community, um, who've wanted to join us or who have wanted advice from us. Um, and true, they're not, uh, they're not uh, fast asleep, let's put it that way. Yeah, good. Look, uh, we, we left off the last episode um, mostly focusing on the history of South Africa. And, and yes. w in reality, we got to the pressing need a little bit sooner than I wanted. We, we, I think we got up to about 1,800 in South Africa's history. Before we get to the pressing need of today, w were there any other significant moments that uh, are noteworthy in the demographic and sociological um, evolution of South Africa in the last 200 years? <clears throat> yes. Um, the slave trade was abolished in 1807 in the British Empire. Slavery, slave ownership, was abolished in 1834. And up until that time, the white inhabitants of South Africa were restricted largely to the southwestern region of modern-day South Africa. The British, at a similar point in time, uh, came to rule South Africa. There were three incidents, 1795, 1803, 1806. And um, there was uh, the, the Boers, the original white settlers, believed that they were getting a very raw deal from the British. For example, when the British abolished slavery, they paid out everybody all across the empire, all the slave owners in, let's say, New Zealand, wherever it may be. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the great ironies is that uh, when they discovered slavery was wrong, they compensated the owners, not the slaves, <laughs> for the end of that trade. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the, uniquely in the world, South African slave owners were required to collect their money in person. In From England. London. Yeah. <laughs> so, so needless to say, none of them did because none of them could afford to leave a farm for six months to go and collect, you know, I mean, and, and they, you weren't allowed to have an agent or a proxy. Wow. So it was considered deeply, deeply perverse. And another very interesting incident happened in the town of Kraft Renet when um, uh, the, the British, actually it was an American guy working for the British, uh, 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 working uh, as a British soldier. Um, hanged four men for an uprising, a rebellion, mm. and the ropes snapped. And the, uh, the crowd went crazy. You know, that clearly this is a divine intervention. Sign of God, yeah. And it was a sort of a, um, I don't know what is the correct term, but it was widely accepted in the world at that time that if such a thing happened, it would be deemed an act of God. Mm -hmm. And this guy refused to accept that. So the soldiers held the crowd back at, you know, gunpoint while they re-strung the men up and re-hanged them. And um, so that, those incidents, the slavery incident and that particular incident of the, the re-hanging mm. precipitated the great trek, the great pull in the 1830s 
of the white population into the interior of South Africa. Now, mm -hmm. shortly prior to that was the Great Crushing, which happened in the interior of South Africa. So here you've got these whiteies on their wagons going into the interior of South Africa shortly after an event known as the Mfetane, the, the crushing. Only liberal, so I'm only going to quote liberal sources now. Okay. Including inter alia, the uh, best buddy of King Shaka Zulu, a man by the name of Henry Francis Finn, who, to whom King Shaka Zulu was so partial that he gave him nine wives. Wow. He couldn't, cope with, yeah, he couldn't cope with all of them, so he kept six and gave three to his brother Frank. The, the Irish guys, right? Right. And they were first-hand observers of what I'm going to describe to you as various other sources. In any war, let's say European wars, because they provide an easy frame of reference, the mortality rate is somewhere between 15 and 25 percent, give or take. So once one quarter of the dudes have been killed, everybody says, okay, we're sorry, we're going home. They turn tail right. In the Infitane, between one and two thirds, according to Henry Francis Finn, two thirds of the entire population of South Africa was murdered. So these black inter Nissan wars led to the, 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 the killing of between one and two thirds of the entire population of the country. This is indisputable. All of the evidence exists. All liberal sources, London Missionary Society, um, uh, as I told you, Henry Francis Finn, um, there was an organization, a, a British, a group of British military observers who, who uh, made observations of these things. And they were not well disposed to the conservative whites who were trekking into the hinterland. So when the whites got there, now again, I'm going to quote liberal sources, not us. Mm -hmm. the, there are many existing documents, diaries, reports, and letters home from missionaries of the London Missionary Society mm -hmm. describing how that interior of South Africa, that hinterland when looked at from the point of view of the dudes who were leaving the Cape, which was obviously more developed, colonially developed, mm -hmm. was scarified of human beings. It was depopulated. These people, you can read in these letters, diaries, and reports, we have been traveling for two weeks to find a tribe to convert. Yep. But we cannot find anybody. Wow. The last person we saw was a black man running across a copy, a little hill, uh, 10 days ago, and so on and so forth. So when the whites moved into this area, whether people like it or not, whether it's fashionable or not, and they whether historians... They had normally seen people. It wasn't just that they were staying out of sight. They'd seen them everywhere else. Just this area was depopulated. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the missionaries arrive in Cape Town and they set off on the, you know, ox wagon, whatever. Mm. And they, uh, they see uh, little Bushman people and Hottentots and the Topnar people and the mm -hmm. Strandloopers and the Griqua people. <laughs> These little super indigenous people, the, you know, the Aboriginal peoples. Yep. Primarily Bushmen, but others too. There are about five of them all together that might be described as ever, ever, aboriginal groups in South Africa. Yep. Most of them extremely, extremely small. Right. <clears throat> but they cross into this area where all of the, this fighting has happened. And there's nobody. Lots of skeletons, lots of burned crawls, home, homesteads or, or villages wow. with no human beings. I'm not saying that was the case across the entire country. I'm saying that if your, your viewers are in any doubt, they can go and read about it. It's a well-known phenomenon recorded by liberals. This is vital. Yep. <clears throat> What's the significance of this? Why, why, why is this relevant to modern well, South African situations? If you consider that, the, that black people had not advanced westward of the Great Fish River, and you look at the rest of the country, mm -hmm. and you then consider that the population of South Africa, and this is more or less um, undisputed, um, was about three million. Some people say as low as about two and a half. 
but let's call it three million. Let's say five million black people lived there and two thirds of them were killed. The mathematics becomes pretty simple. It means that it was a land more or less underpopulated, that there were very few people there. Mm. And that becomes relevant today when black people say, we want our land back in Cape Town. And people like I would say, but there were no blacks in Cape Town. This is a matter of historical record. Mm. You know, there are land claims being made now in the Tsitsikama region between Port Elizabeth, if anybody wants to look on a, on a map, between the, the city of Port Elizabeth and loosely speaking, the city of, uh, of um, uh, George, where, you know, black tribes say, oh, we lived there in the 1300s and then we were, and it's fictional. Right, yep. It also gives the lie to when 40 million black people say, we lived harmoniously on the land and it was taken from us. People like I would say, you may be right to a point, but to a point, there were approximately a million, perhaps a million and a half people left over. Yep. Occupying... 800,000 square kilometers yep. with all due respect. It's not quite the way that it is implied by your tone. Mm. Yep. You know, it's become so, um, the, the new South African rainbow nation is such a supposed paragon of liberal idealism realized mm. that people have a license to use the most, extreme rhetoric without yeah. any foundation in truth. Mm. You know, they, they feel as if they're on safe ground, no matter how wild their claims are, because it's the new South Africa. We're the paragon of, of liberal democracy. Mm. So, you know, nobody's going to shout at us if we exaggerate a little bit. And it's reached the point where people talk absolute nonsense. And there's no historical basis in fact. Um, so anyway, the, these people went into the interior, the 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they founded two uh, independent, uh, not only two, but let's limit ourselves, two independent republics that were uh, um, recognized by the world in 1852 and 1854, namely the Transvaal Republic, or more correctly, the South African Republic, <coughs> and the Orange Free State Republic in 1854, which uh, is, was called the Orange Free State in honor of Prince William of Orange, the, the Protestant Dutchman who stood out against, uh, who, who stood against uh, all the power of Spain when Spain was the mightiest nation or empire in the world. Mm -hmm. So a hero in, in, in the Protestant mythos in the, in the German sense of the word. Right. Yep. Um, and those places prospered, prospered terrifically. There was no apartheid. There was no need for apartheid. Uh, people, you know, kept to themselves, but there wasn't much competition because the populations were respectively very, very low. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> then the British heard of the discovery of diamonds and gold. What did the British do? You know, the rest is history. The first Boer War, the Boers utterly decimated the British. In the second Boer War, the British prevailed after taking the Boer women and children and starving them to death in concentration camps. The world's first use of concentration camps. Uh, in fact, I happen to live very near two of them. Um, so I've spent some time looking at the graves wow. and talking to the people who take care of them. Yes, in fact, two, wow. three years ago, we held a ceremony to reinter a mother and her child. Mm. Um, the woman who who runs the, the, on whose farm the cemetery falls, the cemetery of this concentration camp, mm. sends, periodically sends bones that might be dug up by mongooses to a university. Wow. The university analyzes the bones and sends them back to her and says, right, these are, you know, from one man, these are from a woman, these are from a child, and she then buries them. <clears throat> gives them an honorable burial because they were treated despicably mm. um, at the time by the British soldiers. And on one occasion... It's really fascinating that the British um, started the first known concentration camps. Yeah. So the university got back to her and said, look, are you aware that the 
these, these bones are of a family, as it were. And she said, no, I had no idea. And they said, well, it's a mother and her child. The, these particular bones that you sent us last week, as it were. Mm. We're, we're not just going to separate them and give them back to you so that you can bury them separately. We're going to tell you, by the way, did you know? Mm. And so we held a ceremony to reunite the mother and the child after a hundred and uh, simple arithmetic, 113 years. Wow. That was quite a moving moment. Mm. And many people were in tears. The, the child died shortly after childbirth because usually what the case was, the, the mother was too weak to sustain the child. Yeah. That's terrible. Wow. That's shocking. So the Boer Wars, they finished when? In 1902. Okay. And, and what, like, forgive me, I don't even know. What was the conclusion of the Boer Wars? You said the British prevailed in the second. Um, yes. Were there more? And what was the consequence of that? In the first Boer War, the, the Boers decimated the British. It gave them an absolute hiding and they, they ran off home. But once gold was discovered, they, they came back, particularly for that purpose. Anybody who's in any doubt of the veracity of what I'm saying should read uh, Thomas Pakenham's uh, um, the, the Great Boer War, or is it called the Anglo-Boer War, in which he uh, reveals the contents of the letters of Alfred Lord Milner, who specifically stated in letters mm -hmm. that it was his goal to destroy the Boer nation and nothing else wow. so that they could take, they could take the mines away. Um, which is what happened, um, very, very sadly. Yeah. In the meantime, there was a, a, a notorious incident in which the Boers crossed over into what is now the province of KwaZulu-Natal, what was known for many years as Natal, um, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and uh, Natal as in nativity, etc. Um, and they bought a tract of land from the Zulu king. And the Zulu king said to them, all right, fair deal. You've done everything I asked of you. Um, but there's one last thing. Would you please go and recover some stolen cattle, a rival tribe or kingdom has stolen some cattle from, for me, hmm. which the Boers duly did. And they brought them back to the Zulu king. And they then the king said, well, let's have a bit of a feast. And the Boers said, oh, thanks very much, but we've had enough of this. We want to get back to our families with, who they'd left in mm -hmm. encampments beneath mm -hmm. the famous Drakensberg Mountains. And the king kind of insisted. He said, look, in our culture, whether you like it or not, you have to do this. And they went into the festivity and were promptly all um, grabbed, wrestled, and taken up to a hill behind the king's kraal. And they had stakes rammed up their uh, rectums and out the, the, the tops of their spines. And interestingly, when they were found many months later, the leader of that group had in his, uh, in his pouch, his kind of purse, his handbag, as it were, you know, such as riders carried in those days, slung from one shoulder, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the signed agreement with the king giving that land to the Boer people, that the particular tract of land. Wow. And, um, Was it a significant that, size or just like a big farm? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, I would say the size of, and I'm speaking loosely now, you've put me on the spot, but I'm familiar with it, and so I'll, I'll take a flyer. About the size of New Zealand. Oh, that's significant. That's not just a farm. That's a no, big, no, no. That's a big patch of land. Yeah, yeah, a few, few hundred thousand square kilometers. Wow. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so... Um, but perhaps I'm exaggerating, but it's there or thereabouts. It's, it's a meaningful, meaningful piece of wow, uh, yeah. problem. Interesting. <clears throat> they wanted to establish a republic there, you know? Yeah. And they said, well, I'll give you this. I can afford this. You know, I'll keep the rest. Is there, is there any insight into why the Zulu king did that? Was he always going to deceive them, always going to use them and then abuse them? Or did something snap like, um, you know, they, they looked at his wife the wrong way and, and that's it, you're all dead? Uh, let me say this. Bear in mind that at that time, the population of South Africa was so small that land didn't have the value that it has today. Mm -hmm. You know, 
to give away a massive tract of land like that is nothing if you're a few hundred thousand people occupying hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. Hmm. He, I think, w- was happy to do the deal. According to the, uh, the very famous Zulu authority who was murdered in his house, he was shot through the chest by two guys from the community that he was helping a few years ago, David Rattray, says that what changed the Zulu king's mind was the success in getting the cattle back from his opponent. He allegedly said to his retainers, look, anybody who can do this so easily and so quickly is to be feared. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he kind of, uh, uh, reneged. Reneged. there's a, there's a, a sad, um, predictable irony in, um, in what happened to that researcher. Yes, yeah, very, very sad because he loved the Zulu people, adored them. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, two guys came to his house one night and wanted to rob it and, you know, he wasn't so keen on the robbery and so they made their point more strongly than he made his. Shot him through the heart. Wow. Yeah. Stone dead in the, the front, the yeah. doorway of his house, yeah. Okay, so bring me up to um, apartheid. Well, I just Why want did, to finish. Because uh, okay, sure. I'll be, I'll be very going. brief. Yeah, so... Over the, the, the successive couple of days, the Zulu king sent his impis, his soldiers, to the Boer women and children's encampments in the foothills of the Drakensberg mountain. Mm-hmm. And at not only three, but particularly three locations, Murtspreit, Viernen, and uh, Blokrans, all the women and children were, uh, you know, had their throats cut. The women were gutted. Wow. So what they would do is they would... Uh, gut them to see if there was a fetus um, and then they would take the fetus out and kill it separately Mm. and they would remove the woman's gallbladder and drink the gall Uh, and then they would make a certain cry which means I have eaten Um, eaten human flesh so I am a champion I'm a superstar Um, yeah so it was a terrible grievous 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 massacre all those little babies and according to the, about two or three people survived, people who hid in bushes and, and so on. And all of them say, gave the same accounts about how the children were killed. Wow. All of the children were killed by having their skulls crushed, crushed on the wagon wheels. So wow. bash, bash, wow. they stave their skulls in. Yeah. Anyway, so that, that is the story. Very, very sad incident. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you have questions. Yeah, bring me up to apartheid. Where, when did that get brought in and how? Why? The British introduced a system that did not have the name apartheid. But after, the, after winning the Second Boer War, the Second Anglo-Boer War in 1902, and colonizing South Africa, <coughs> the British deemed that it would be best if there was a set of laws to govern the relationships between the races. And so the British, for the first time in South Africa's history, implemented race laws. Those race laws remained in force at the behest of the British Empire, very particularly the British, um, until South African independence in 1961. And then the apartheid laws were implemented subsequently. So initially it it was very, very much a British thing. Why? Why did they feel race laws were necessary? I don't really know. I think that it was partly an economic thing. I've read about how the British um, responded to the mine owner's needs for labor. And they did things like imposing a hut tax on all of the black huts around South Africa, all of the homes, each home had a tax, so which uh, enforced people to go and seek formal labor rather than to be, um, uh, I don't know what the word is. Self-employed. Exactly, subsistence subsistence farmers. Right, okay, good. Um, Yeah. so in driving people to go and seek formal labor, mm. they had to control them yep. to some extent. You know what I mean? Yeah. They had to say, well, if we're going to force you all to the mines, 
you must live here because you are black. Right. And this why, you know, previously people had sought, had sought out sought, as it were. You know, uh, sought seeks out sought. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and that, that was changed uh, when there was an enforced change imposed by the British. Okay. Tell me, what are the, we're going to move to modern history soon, but um, mm. tell me, what are the atrocities? The, the gross violations of, of human rights and, and common decency that have been perpetrated in, uh, I don't want, obviously we, it could be an exhaustive history. We might be here for eight hours or more, but um, mm. in a nutshell, uh, mm. I, I don't want us to pretend that um, whites have a spotless history in South Africa. And mm. I think mm. nobody mm. could hold a straight face while saying such a thing. Um, mm. what, what are the reasonable complaints that, that coloureds and black people have in, in South Africa? What, what are the things that there should be justice for, mm. perhaps that there hasn't been justice for yet? You know, Dave, this is a, a complicated subject. I don't want to, to shy away from it, and I have never shied away from it, yep. never, ever. Um, in fact, I quite like it as a question because it's challenging. But let me interrupt you for a second. A just to, just to your, your question one second. By no means does any kind of wrong justify any other kind of wrong. There is no justification for murder, no, 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 violence, no, no. dispossession. I, I don't I have a problem with that. that. I, I know you don't know that, but I want to say that for everybody else. Just because we're acknowledging that wrong has mm. been done, there is no justification for more um, lawlessness. But let me put. You, let me tell you what the, what the problem is. Imagine your kids are up to some nonsense. You catch them out, mm. and you catch out one of the kids lying, and you lose your temper. You're really angry with your child. Weeks later, you discover that there was a reason for the lie. Not that it makes lying okay, mm. but that there was a reason and you feel very, very bad. It's happened to me as a father where I've realized that my child's behavior on the surface was not what it was underneath. Let me say this to you. It would be easy for me to sit here and say, apartheid was so bad and it, it brought down the dignity of poor little human beings. Mm. But there is more to the story. The, the black population of South Africa today is about 42 million. The black population of South Africa in a famous census conducted in 19, 1950, if I'm not mistaken, was about 5 million. Wow. In evil apartheid, evil white people built the world's largest hospital in the world the largest hospital in the world was built by white people for black people in South Africa so that women could give birth to live young. Yeah. Resulting in an eightfold. Uh, guys, I, 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 I don't want to patronize your, your viewers. I don't want to seem condescending. I don't want to be sarcastic or facetious. But if you can do arithmetic, not maths, not mathematics, arithmetic, your first, second, and third year of school, what you learned then, if yeah. you can do basic, basic. arithmetic, Yep. An eight-fold increase in the population over 40 years, because in 1994, the black population was about 40 million. Wow. Uh, in sociological terms, a generation is 25 years. Some people procreate at the age of 11, God forbid. Yeah. Others procreate at the age of 60. God and forbid. good luck to <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I read yesterday that, uh, that Sylvester Stallone's ex-wife is having her fifth child at the age of 54. Oh, Personally, I congratulate her. More energy than I do. But the, the average is 25 right. years for a generation. Yep. That means in under two generations, there was an eight-fold increase in the black population of South Africa. Wow. That didn't happen. It was not a miracle. It wasn't divine intervention. Mm. So yes, apartheid, very bad. But I was the one human being in the whole world who was not a member of the ANC during the plenary session of the election of Jacob Zuma. The room was cleared of all journalists. They were kicked out on their backsides by the ANC security. All the cameras were turned off and confiscated and so on. It happened in secret. But I was there. 
And at a certain point in time, the two factions of the ANC clashed and they, they punched one another, broke the tables. These are the ANC, the leaders of the African National Congress. Wow. Smashing the microphones and so on and so forth. And I turned to a guy next to me who I happen to know very well from my past, you know, a buddy of mine, a very nice man. His name is Morbi. It means ugly in Zulu. This is the, the name his mom gave him. And I said to him, <laughs> yeah, that's his, his birth name, his, his real name. His so mom called him, him ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I said to Morbi, yeah, we're not all Morbi. Why are these people losing their minds this way? And he said, it comes down to one thing. This is an ANC activist, prominent ANC activist. Right. It comes down to the fact that white people looked after us better than the ANC has done since the beginning of democracy. Yeah. We want what you gave us from our leaders and they can't do it. I know I sound like an apologist for apartheid. But no, no look, mean, right now you don't. You don't to me um, because, because it's manifestly obvious throughout the continent on which you exist that the absence of British colonialism has left a vacuum filled by corruption and incompetence. Um, mm. Famine, drought, disaster, civil war, genocide, mm. Um, mm. disaster after disaster after disaster. And mm. where Western civilization and democracy has flourished, um, civility, technology, development, health, um, longevity, mm. maternal mortality rates, um, infant mortality mm. rates, all of these yes. things are ideal and optimal and improving. Um, mm. There's a stark contrast and, and it's not to justify evil or human rights violations, yes. but it is to state the facts. The data is indisputable. Make mm -hmm. your own conclusions from it. I don't care. Um, mm -hmm. Don't infer any from what I'm saying, but I am saying you don't sound like an apologist. You sound like an observer of the facts. Yeah. And I think Dave, I would like to believe that that's what I am because I haven't always been some kind of foaming at the mouth, you know, kill the blacks kind of lunatic. Good. I have always believed that there is a truth and we should scratch for the truth and find out what it is. And even right if it makes now, us very uncomfortable, even if, yes. it, even if it horrifies us. Yes. And right now the truth is that it seems as if the divergent values of the primary population groups of South Africa are intractable. Hmm. I may that's, be that's wrong. Uh, and look, but it's, hmm. it's, it's Pollyanna-ish to, to think that the truth will always be pleasant. Mm. Um, mm. It, I think to be able to confront the truth and be really, really upset by it, um, mm. it isn't a bad thing. Um, mm. the, truth, mm. the truth is upsetting sometimes yeah. and we wish it were otherwise, but that doesn't make it otherwise. And pretending mm. it's otherwise disempowers mm. us of any ability and any opportunity to change mm. or help or provide solutions. When we live in denial, yeah. there's nothing we can do to help anybody. Yeah. The, the, the problem though, is that if you continue down this rabbit hole, the problem for me, perhaps not for you, is that it, the truth becomes more than just difficult. It becomes, it becomes the very opposite mm. of everything that you believe. I'll give you an example. Two days ago, a, a gentleman from the USA, whom I know very well, a very nice, soft, gentle, sweet, good-natured man, and extremely highly intelligent, was chatting to me about genetics because he just had his genetic profile or whatever you call it done. It's the biggest oh, yeah. his DNA history. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they love it. And um, yeah, it, he, he had a theory about Neanderthals, and I, I didn't know this. But I, I, because I didn't know, I, I asked him background questions, you know. And I discovered that all of the races in the world have Neanderthal DNA except the Negroid race. Now, I'm not saying that makes 
the Negroid race better or worse or whites better? Or it, yeah, I'm not saying, I don't know what that I'm means. so happy to be a caveman. I'm a caveman. You know, I'm a crow magnon. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying that unfortunately, <laughs> if you really pursue these subjects, you get to the point where you have to analyze behavior. And once you start analyzing behavior and you do it methodically or in a scholarly way, you get into genetics. And once you get into genetics, well, all of the implications are racial. It's a very, very, very difficult subject. And I said to her... Yeah, upsetting and difficult. Hmm? Upsetting and difficult, yes. Yes, yes. I, I'm not even comfortable with it. And mm. I represent a right-wing organization. You know? It's well, very, yeah. very difficult. Uh, uh, our much maligned reputation is undeserved. We're not extremists. We just want <laughs> facts, truth, data, evidence without political correctness, spin, and um, subjective agendas and narratives imposed on us. We just want the yeah. facts. Um, you, know what I, you know what I like very much is the knowledge that Jews have a higher IQ than my people do and that Southeast Asians do. Mm. It makes me feel so comfortable in my own skin to know that I can never be a supremacist because I've already, I have already possess knowledge that negates the notion of wow. my people being supreme. Yep. You know? That's good point. Uh, it it yep. makes me feel so good inside. It makes me feel at peace with myself and yep. at peace with the world yep. because I don't feel as if the world is perhaps judging me for something which I may or may not, but I'm not sure and they're not sure, mm. believe. Yeah. Hey, listen, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Bring it home in maybe 10 to 15 minutes um, with perhaps the most important point of this. Uh, you know, maybe we should even stop here and do a part three. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take direction from you if we can't do this in, in 15 minutes. But tell the viewers what's happening in South Africa in the last 20 years, the last 10 years, the last two years. Why is Sightlanders needing to prepare for a civil emergency? Uh, I'll do it synoptically. Over the past, as I said to you earlier, the first multiracial uh, democratic elections occurred on the 27th of April, 1994. So South Africa's democracy is 24 years old. Hmm. Um, in the recent or in the last almost 30 years, so if we include the period shortly before multiracial democracy, when there was a great deal of conflict in South Africa, and there was a lot of great breakdown in law and order, the country was in turmoil. Over that 24 to 30 year period, there has been a consistent trajectory, an incline in crime, in rape, as a matter of interest to you, um, just over one third, slightly more than one third, slightly more than one in three women in South Africa will be raped at least once in her lifetime. And there has been a corresponding decline in the governance of the country. The education is substantially poorer. The health system is, by many factors, weaker. And so on and so forth. And every year we hear more and more and more scandals. And every year, the government and the populace alike, um, the proletariat, if you like, become more radicalized. So just as everything's crumbling, the government and the people are saying, we want more. Yeah. And we want to give less. And we believe that that is impelling our country to a crisis. Um, turning and turning in a widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear, the falconer, the center cannot hold. Um, we believe that there is an inevitability mm. about this. And that if you observe the trajectory over time, in the absence of any sign, at any sign, and there is no sign, not one, that that sphere in this trajectory, this cricket ball of the state of South Africa, shows no sign of slowing down, stopping, or reversing. Indeed, it is accelerating 
to its destination. And we believe that that is a civil war. If we're wrong, let the world laugh at us. Mm. Please, let the whole world snicker behind our backs until our dying days. But for now, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt because the evidence of such a trajectory mm. is overwhelmingly in our favor. Yep. Crime is out of hand, murder, rape, robbery, car hijackings, illegal invasions of land. Uh, we now have 3.1 million taxpayers. This, these are government statistics. 3.1 million taxpayers and 16.3 million people on social grants. Wow. It's unsustainable. Wow. Our official that's, that's one rate. person, roughly, that, that's one in five people paying tax. Um, yes. One, yeah. one person looking after themselves and four others. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, wow. Not to mention looking after their family. So perhaps right. looking after nine other people. Right. Because mm. their family is not on a social grant if they're working and paying tax. I mean, just to be clear on the thing. Yep. Um, so the labor of one must support nine. Yeah. Um, the, our official unemployment rate is 38.1%. On every occasion that our government releases unemployment statistics, statisticians, learned people write into newspapers and they say, for this, 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 and this reason, those statistics are incorrect. The government is lying. And I have to tell you that their argument is generally more plausible in scholarly terms than the government's argument. And generally, it's recognized that the unemployment rate in South Africa is not 38.1%, but that it's over 50%. Wow. We have a government that cannot govern. Mm. And our society is sliding into a, a, a vortex of disaster and chaos and corruption and so on. I have to That's let the viewers know that um, it's been more than a week between part one and part two in, in interviewing Simon. And that's been quite often because he has to find a town with electricity. Um, I've been complaining incessantly about my, my internet connection not being fast enough. The NBN, the national broadband network is never going to come to my house. So they've told me it's at least going to be next year sometime. And, um, and, and I feel like such a spoilt little rich kid for complaining about that when Simon can't even find a town with power. Um, and you know, South Africa is rapidly turning into a third world undeveloped nation. Um, yeah, absolutely. And at, at what cost has, has, um, just to be clear, yeah, I live, I live approximately 300 meters away from a 240 megawatt hydroelectric turbine. Wow. <laughs> they can't do it. They just can't do yeah. it. The poor guys can't do it. Yeah. And look, you, you get called a racist if you observe that they're having difficulties with competency, but um, facts are yeah. facts and the facts don't care about your feelings. Um, I'm not a racist. If you think I'm a racist, I think you're a jerk. So we're even, let's get back to talking about facts. Um, yeah. Simon, last question. Um, what do you think of uh, um, Lauren Southern and uh, the work she's doing? Her documentary Farmlands is uh, about to be released, if, if not today. Yeah. Let, let me tell you a, sh a short story. Lauren Southern's producer contacted me. I previously dealt with her, but hadn't, you know, spoken to her for, let's say, six months. And her producer contacted me and uh, said to me, um, Lauren would like to come out to South Africa. Uh, can you give us some advice? And I had a long chat with him about transport and accommodation, this, that, and the next thing. In the course of the conversation, I said, look, you know, I don't know what sort of a budget Lauren is on. I have a spare double bed in my house. Um, so she can stay here or, you know, whatever. If you don't want to get accommodation, uh, rent, you know, go to a guest house. But this is me talking to this chap. But my impression of Lauren is that she's a bit of a princess and she'd probably rather stay in the guest house than in my house. And he said to me, I think you've got a, an incorrect impression of Lauren Southern. And I thought to myself, oh, no, she's a princess, man. Anyway, so she comes to South Africa and she spent nine days with me. And on the first day, we had a big barbecue at my house. 
And it, one of her producers locked us into my garden. It wasn't his fault. It was mine. But here we're locked in now. And we have high gates and walls. I thought, oh, dear me, how am I going to get these, you know, particularly Lauren, this princess, out. We had to get out to get back in again. Long story. So I uh, vaulted up onto the top of the gate, which is about 10 foot high. Wow. So it's, it is a 10 foot high gate. I vaulted to the top of the, the, the gate. And as I got to the top and I was going over, here comes this sort of flash of blonde hair, passing, boom, onto the floor. So Lauren Southern has my eternal respect for the work that she does and for her personality. She's a good girl. She's solid, reliable, dependable. I think she's a superstar. She's, she's awesome. the real McQueen. Awesome. Awesome. Good to hear. Look, uh, if you viewing, I apologize. I've, we've spent all our time on history. Um, I really wanted to talk more, but maybe that's made it a little bit more PG rated because the details are horrific of the suffering um, in the farmlands of South Africa. And, and it should yeah. make you cry and it should break your heart. And there's something mm. wrong with you if it doesn't make you angry and emotional. Mm. Let me encourage you to get the details by watching Lauren Southern's new documentary, Farmlands. It's, I haven't seen it yet, but I know the work Lauren Southern. I've seen the trailers have moved me to tears. Um, just watching these poor people suffering who have done nothing wrong. They're on the land that their family has worked for centuries and yeah. they're just being just being violated in the most unimaginable ways. Um, I can't tell my wife or my mum the details because they are mm. so horrendously inhumane. It would mm. make you sick. Um, please be aware. Go and find the documentary Farmlands. And if you're in Australia and you can get to one of the capital cities, Lauren Southern, along with Stefan Molyneux, are touring Australia. Um, in July and I believe there's also a stop in New Zealand get along and hear what she has to say in person ask questions if you're a doubter if you're a skeptic by all means ask questions argue debate challenge but let's do the research and let's not let our facts reign not let our feelings reign supreme let's pursue the facts let's use the facts the evidence the data our common sense our own two eyes mm -hmm. And, and let's, you know, stand against injustice and stand with our fellow human beings, whatever color their skin is, when they're suffering, and just ask, what can we do to help? And as a Christian, as a believer in God, whatever you want to pray to, um, let's, let's offer them our thoughts and our prayers. Um, that South Africa has peace, peace for everybody um, and, and justice for everybody. Um, those two things every human on the planet should should have and should not live without peace, justice, and hope. So, um, Simon, thank you so much for the work you're doing, um, telling the world about what's going on in South Africa. Um, my prayers certainly are with you and with your family and with your nation. And um, yeah, I just uh, hope that uh, hope that you can avoid somehow a crisis in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. And thank you for your willingness to expose our story to, um, to have us on your show. Of course. It's, it's the least that I can do. Thank you. Good night. Well, that is it for uh, Pello Talk. And what I would like to invite you to do as the viewer is to visit the Sightlanders website. Um, the links are in beneath this video. And I want to encourage you to do what you can financially to help them prepare to defend their homes and their families. Uh, it's only by the work of generous supporters that I can keep bringing stories like this. People like you who are enjoying this and want more information than you're not getting in the mainstream media. People partnering with me for as little as just $3 a month as a recurring donation. There's also a, um, a fundraiser and an equipment fundraiser there, which, which people have been very generous for as well. But let me encourage you to, to please, um, you know, invest in the uh, Sightlanders um, civil defense strategy and uh, make sure that you're subscribed to, to Pello Talk. If you're watching on YouTube, um, subscribe to the channel and then make sure you hit that little bell button to be notified when a new episode goes live. You can also follow on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. 
And of course, head to the website, davepello.com and subscribe to the emails. It is inevitable that one day I'm going to be kicked off YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or wherever you would like to see me. And if I've got your email address, I'll be able to shoot you a note and say, this is what's going on. It's important that you know where I am now. And that way we'll take away the power of those leftist corporations from ever, um, you know, taking, disconnecting us from having these conversations, the power's back in your hands. So that's it from me for this episode of Pello Talk. Thank you for watching. And I look forward to seeing the comments and the arguments in the comments beneath this video. Keep it civil, be nice. Let's talk about facts, evidence, data, and logic and stay true.